Each year, nearly three million pilgrims from around the world travel to Saudi Arabia for the annual Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. If they have the means, every Muslim should perform Hajj at least once in their lifetime. This year, more than 20,000 pilgrims set out from Britain on their incredible journey. I had no excuse not to perform a Hajj. Hajj is compulsory. It's compulsory in every person who has the means and the ability and the health to do it, they should do it. And I will do it again, inshallah, again and again if I can. This year, PC Muhammad Marouf is travelling with his sister and 10-year-old son, Abdul Rauf. Next Sunday? I'm travelling next Monday. I'm taking my young son with me. Oh, is he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's, he's, he's only 10. For university student Sandy, the decision to perform Hajj has taken her family by surprise. There were no plans for me to go on Hajj this year. It happened completely unexpectedly at the last minute, which seems to be the way actually everything happens in our family. I don't wear a headscarf, and I'm not an incredibly religious person anyway. I mean, all my friends know that I'm Muslim, but I'm not very religious. I mean, belief is a choice, really. Um, and I've sort of, for a while now, been trying to reach some sort of fundamental, I don't know, structure for myself. Another on her way to the annual gathering is Harley Street neurosurgeon Dr. Amina. What am I doing as a Western woman following the religion of Islam? I think I was really just searching for other religions to help me be a better Christian. But it's become, to me, the most logical conclusion of my search. I'm going to be joining two and a half million people dressed in white in the desert looking for God and most people are a bit puzzled by this and a rather sleepy patient of mine said why is he lost <laughs> and I realized no it's where that's lost it's us Most of the pilgrims traveling to Saudi Arabia from Britain have their trips organized by specialist travel agents. They can also help an unaccompanied woman to make the journey by ensuring she travels in a group with other women and a religious leader. That is for your wife with the visa, alhamdulillah. And then her ticket. All right. She came especially from China. And alhamdulillah that we managed to get her as a visa by the approval of the Saudi embassy. All right. Okay. The challenge of catering for such a vast influx of humanity is a daunting one. But the Saudis take immense pride in rising to the task. We are now in the midst of preparing for this Hajj season. It's a great occasion, it's a great challenge. We look at this as challenging work. We don't treat Hajj as a mass movement. Each group, actually each individual, uh, is a Hajji by himself. It's somebody whom we try to cater for and cater for his needs and provide him with the elements of the environment that he wants, that he has in mind. You know, Mina, one of the high sites, is, is a, it turns into a small city. More than two million people actually live there for that one week. We have to provide the electricity, the water, the living conditions, the hygiene, everything that a human being, an individual, will need to live somewhere. So it's a city in the full sense of the word. If, for example, one of your neighbors is finding it extremely difficult to cope, is in dire need of something, you know, basic necessities like food or clothing or shelter or something like that, it wouldn't be right for me to leave him and then go off and do hajj. 
what I would probably do is give up my money that I'm going to spend on doing this hajj and, and allow him to actually you know, look after his needs first. Yeah, and that will be a greater reward for me than actually doing the hajj itself. The journey in the old days was perilous. People would take months to cross very frightening countries, would face brigands, would face uh, death, would face disease. Um, and to come back from Hajj was, many people just didn't expect to ever see you again. Uh, today we're a little bit more comfortable um, and people will expect to see me again. Oh, fantastic. This will do. I'm not going to be taking very much. Right. Very minimal sort of like packing, just very basic clothes, no makeup, hair care products, don't, any of that sort of thing. Don't take this with you as a handbag. Still big for a handbag. <laughs> no, don't worry about that. There's yeah. no sign. I couldn't get it over my shoulder. Yeah. First of all, many congratulations. Thank you very much. I was yeah. hoping I would get your blessing for this. You've got my yeah. blessing. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to tell me all about it when you've you done it. Come I, back. Indeed I am. Yeah. I even went to my employer. You know, and, and I spoke to him, you know, got his blessings as well. Um, and, and, and that's the way it should be, you know, seek permission of the people around you before you leave. And you're going to come back and see us once, uh, once uh, I'll be looking forward to that. Yeah, I'll be fully briefed. Okay. Scrabble. No, I'm not going to take Scrabble. Um, on the mountain you have to wear white, apparently. Or most people like to wear white. Um, and so I'm going to be wearing like this white Galabia type thing. We say Galabia because we're Egyptian. In Egypt say Galabia. Anyone else you say Jalabia. Long, sort of like relatively loose stuff. Um, headscarves, um, sandals, very basic things. Um, but the weather should be great. It'll be a nice change. You're not supposed to wear perfume or anything like that. I, I mean, I can understand you not really being able to wear perfume there because you're not really, you know, it's not that sort of thing. It's all about simplicity and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I don't know, because I was having this sort of discussion with my mum the other, way, other day about moisturiser. Mm -hmm. And apparently if you have perfumed moisturiser or whatever, it, you shouldn't really. But uh, I don't think so. I think moisturiser's fine. I mean, as long as it's not perfume, then it's not really going to be a big deal, is how I see it. Contact lens solution. This is my third Hajj, so I know what to expect in terms of material comfort and discomfort and how you go here, there and everywhere and the things that can go wrong and these are the external details. The journey to the centre of your soul is something that is so frightening that it's very easy to lose focus. It's very easy to find yourself preoccupied with other details, like your luggage has got lost, or they didn't book your hotel, or the bus has crashed, or other things like that. And the material distractions on Hajj are just as compelling as the distractions at home if you want them to be. preoccupation, which is to discover who you are in front of your Lord. And so what you bring to your pilgrimage of yourself, I bring nothing, I bring intention. You leave the familiarity of your home, you leave your country, you leave your nationality, even leave your language sometimes. You become a stranger in a strange place. You put on clothes which make you look different to your normal self and are simple. You have to attain the simplicity of an external appearance that apparently you're trying to achieve internally. We 
in Saudi Arabia, I think of Hajj as just being next door. But we appreciate the fact that if you come all the way from China, if you come all the way from Britain, if you come all the way from uh, Africa, it's a, a lifetime experience. It's something you have been looking forward to, wanting to do. It's, it's a climate, it's a high, it's, it's such a, uh, an experience. Of course, there is the religious dimension, all these people, all those thousands upon thousands who come here to communicate with their creator. We want to give them the privacy, we want to give them the space so that they can do this at their own pace. Uh, we want to create the environment whereby each and every Muslim among the two million plus Muslims who come for Hajj will feel that he is there all by himself communicating with his creator. During the weeks leading up to Hajj, Jeddah's international airport becomes one of the busiest in the world, with planes filled with pilgrims arriving around the clock at the specially built Hajj terminal. Oh, the flight was very tiring. It was a long, long journey. It's been almost 12 hours since we've been on the plane. By the time we got here, it's been very, very tiring, especially for this young man. You know, it's his first long journey like that. Isn't it? How are you feeling? I feel quite tired, weak. Yeah, we're feeling very weak. Yeah, are you cold as well? Yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been such a long journey for him as well. So we're just looking forward to getting out there and getting some rest. Everything has to work in sync, everything has to function, all the logistics, all the arrangements have to be in place way ahead of time. It's a logistic of meeting the Hajis at ports of entry, transporting the Hajis to Mecca and Medina and to the Hajj sites, making sure that their uh, stay in the Hajj sites is well taken off. Hajj is all about patience. When you've got so many people from so many different roles and communities and cultures and backgrounds all coming, I mean, we tend to judge everything by European standards, and we can't expect that here. Because people come from the African continent, the Asian continent, the European continents, the Americans, uh, everybody comes here expecting the, the, their own kind of style here. And when it all mixes together, then you get this really healthy relationship. <laughs> Every year, since 15 years ago. I didn't have any intention to come back every year because yes. what you get from Makar Medina, you can't get anywhere else in the world. Yes, I see. You know? Having finished the formalities, the pilgrims now board their buses for the trip to Mecca, some 45 miles away, while others make their way down from Medina, 250 miles north. I think about 36 hours already. It's a long day. The journey has been absolutely exhausting. We just sort of got on the bus uh, last night um, at Medina. So let's say we were on this bus for about 15 hours and imagine trying to sleep on this bus. Uh, exhausting. I mean, I tried to read a bit, I tried to sleep a bit, chatted a bit to various people. Um, so you just try and pass the time, really. I'm lucky in that I am quite patient. It's been interesting. We arrive with great hope after an extremely pleasant plane journey to find we had not been met by any representative. We waited 15 hours in the airport before somebody arrived. Alhamdulillah. What it shows is that you're rewarded for patience. Our group is a lovely one. We have 40 people representing 14 countries. And a lot of us are professional people. And used to organizing, used to controlling. You can't be in control in your spiritual life. Allah is in control. And the, the, the tug of war of submission and wanting to feel that you can call the shots um, was all there on Jeddah Airport. <laughs> Oh, 
كلهم حجاج من وين هم؟ ايش جنسياتهم؟ التوفيق ان شاء الله قبول I think I had some miracles happen to me. Like on a couple of occasions at least. There was this time when um, basically the area where, where the Prophet Muhammad's buried. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is like drinking water. Uh, which was given to us. Actually, th this is one of the excellent things about Hajj. We got, like, all along the way on the bus rides where we stopped. Uh, like, there are loads of places where you have to stop and people check your passports and that sort of thing. Um, little packages being handed out filled with, like, water and fruit juice and, like, dates and sort of, like, biscuits and, and nibbles and that sort of thing, which is very sweet. And it's, like, things that people have done uh, for people on Hajj to sort of make their journey easier. And of course, they get loads of brownie points for it too. First time you seen it in real life. Beautiful. You wait till you get inside. Yeah. But you can't wait to go inside, innit? All right. Thank you. Yalla, oh, Mohammed. So Sahel of Nizul. I don't want to put my stuff on the floor. <laughs> Okay, damn it, I'm just going to put my stuff on the floor. <sighs> Some pilgrims have endured a far tougher journey. What's your name? Muhammad Jafar Qadiri. So, who are you going to live in the area? I'm going to live in the Bihar state. Are you going to live in the same way? I'm going to live in the same way. मैं अपने घर से निकला 28 मई 1998 में निकला तो मैं हज और दियारत करते हुए मैं आ रहा हूँ हर वली अल्लाह के दरबार से मैं दियारत करते हुए दरुस फातिया पढ़ते हुए मैं आ रहा हूँ सारे मुल्कों से कोशिश करता हूँ मैं कि जुमे के नमाज पढ़ने के लिए मकाम वैसे अल्लाह मालिक है अल्लाह कौन जाने वाला है came here there was about 12 people in this room we rearranged the mattresses so everybody was given a little bit of space but that doesn't matter really because this place is all about leaving behind the material things it's about leaving behind all the worldly desires and uh, I think compared to uh, what, what what we should be expecting this is like luxury we've got a place to eat we've got a place to drink we've got a place to sleep and we've got a terrific view out there it's, it's one of the best views I think you'll ever get you look out the window and you can just see the, the, the main door of the Kaaba and that's the best thing about this place. Because if I want to just stand up and just look at it, then that's a, a worship in its own right. What we're going to do now is hopefully the azan, the call to prayer, will happen very shortly for the midday prayer. We'll go off and we'll do our midday prayer. And then uh, my sister hasn't done her room right. She was totally gone as well. Once in Mecca, the first thing the pilgrims do is to visit the Haram, or Holy Mosque, where they will perform the Umrah, or lesser pilgrimage, before the actual Hajj begins. This takes place day and night, stopping only for the five daily prayers. During the Hajj season, the mosque overflows and the crowds of worshippers spill out onto the streets, far beyond the Haram.
Having prayed outside, the pilgrims jostle to get inside the mosque where they will first perform the tawaf, or circling of the Kaaba, as part of the Umrah. We did our Umrah, which basically involves um, going to uh, the Kaaba, which is like the most holy of holy sort of buildings for Muslims that was built by Abraham and his son, Ishmael. He went to the mosque there, the Haram, which is the most beautiful mosque I've ever seen in my entire life. I couldn't believe it. It was like being in a fairy tale. It's built out of this beautiful marble. Um, these birds tweeting and flying around all over the place. And then in the middle, you go in and the cab is there and it just looks completely magical as well. And it's in the sunshine and it's unbelievable. What did you feel when you first saw the cab? Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. We did Omra, which basically involves um, going around the Kaaba seven times and uh, reciting sort of diets or prayers, that sort of thing, to God. And basically, Omra is in a way to sort of bring you closer to God. I find it really good to be here. The closest I've been to it, I've seen it in tapes and stuff, but not good as this. I've dreamt of uh, different things it could be, but this was the most beautiful one I've dreamt of. But it wasn't a dream, it was real life. I think he's just full of euphoria. <laughs> and um, I think he'll get to a stage when he'll get his hangover. But um, as long as he's enjoying it, I'm just going to let him enjoy it. Following the circling of the Kaaba and a short prayer, the pilgrims stopped to drink water from the well of Zamzam before performing the Sai, running to and fro between the two nearby hills of Safa and Marwa. And when we were doing Sai between the two hills, he asked me what that was all about and I explained to him that um, Prophet Ibrahim's wife left Ismail, put him on the floor. There were none of these buildings, there were just two hills. And she went running around looking for water. And when we run between the two hills, that's what we do. On the first day of Hajj, the pilgrims leave Mecca for the tent city of Mina, some five miles away. Traditionally on this day, pilgrims get their water and provisions ready for the day ahead. The Hajj journey is never expected to be smooth. Um, for two reasons, first of all, because the logistics of transporting two and a half million people in the same direction on the same day is necessarily extremely complicated. But at another level, the Hajj journey is also a metaphor of your search for Allah. In Islam, we're told that Allah provides for our Hajj. Everything that happens to us is his provision. Now, this isn't to say that he's extremely sadistic, because we know Allah is the most compassionate. So when we encounter difficulties, we see it as a metaphor of the spiritual life, especially in the 21st century. to Mina last night which was it was nice it was like the smoothest sort of most relaxing bus journey and the shortest that we've had during the whole so far um, so it wasn't so far we came here um, in the tent oh my god we had to sleep on the floor in a tent just like Bedouins and that was I couldn't sleep it was so lumpy I came completely unprepared I didn't have a clue that I was supposed to bring a mat or a sleeping bag and therefore I end up having to sleep on a lumpy floor through my own fault completely we have air conditioning, thank God. The washing facilities aren't that bad. They're just not what we're used to. This is, uh, this is Mina. This is tent D27. So if you want to come in and have a look, it's, it's actually quite nice, isn't it? It's quite, 
we've got the air conditioning up there, it's blowing out some really nice cool air at the moment. As you can see, there's only men in here. All the women and the young ones are next door, apart from my son that is, because he's special. And um, he wants to stay with his dad anyway, because he wants to learn from, from the elders here. Um, this is the last day that we have um, before we actually go to the Mount of Mercy. The Mount of Mercy is actually based in the, in the Arafat, and once we leave here, is that we go straight there after tomorrow morning's prayer. And um, once we've done our midday prayer, everybody's going to get up and start begging for mercy, because uh, that is where your prayers will be answered. And tomorrow you'll probably witness after sun, uh, after after mid afternoon, when the sun has gone down, and they've done their asr prayer. Everybody's going to start coming out with the emotions and start crying, and nobody's going to really want to know what's going on around them. Everybody's going to really, really be full of passion and emotion and asking for forgiveness. You know, I'm already feeling the emotions. So I just want to cry. And I sat here earlier on and trying to repress some of the tears because I'm going to save them for tomorrow. As dawn breaks, the pilgrims begin their trip to the plain of Arafah and the Mount of Mercy, five miles away. This is the day that everyone has been waiting for. The hardships is what the Hajj is all about. Is that we're here for the material to life. We're here to actually shed all that. This is all about remembering Allah. Yeah, we're all equal. No one here is actually rich or poor. And I think when you go out then you'll see everybody's dressed like this. And you can't tell who's the king and who's the prince and who's the pauper, who's the servant. This is where you will actually really witness the city in its fullest sense because you will see people from all walks of life, all dressed the same, all looking the same, all here for one purpose, to try and connect with their Lord. Having arrived at Arafah, the pilgrims make their way to their campsites to prepare themselves for this day of intense prayer and contemplation. Do you wonder why, when you're a stranger, you feel so at home? And you ask people from other countries, and it's the same experience. And everybody arrives thinking, I belong. Have you met my friend Ima? And Ima is my name. At a very deep centre of your heart, it's nothing to do with cultural identity. It's to do with a, a coming home, as if this is the place you always were. Oh, 
Following the midday prayer and a sermon on the significance of this day, the worshippers return to their tents to rest, read from the Quran, and to pray. Others will try to reach the Mount of Mercy where they will stand asking God for forgiveness. I had a, many, an opportunity to pray and to think and to focus very, very seriously on the point of Arafah. And on Arafah, you have to expect and dare to believe and humbly uh, receive what is given to you and it's plenty. So, having been encouraged by the mercy that I'd been shown, I then felt a bit restless and I went up on the mountain and I was standing on this rock looking out over this amazing valley and I could see just this sea of people praying. And of course you feel Abrahamic, you're standing on the mountain. So I prayed and prayed, and I was praising God, praising everything, spent about half an hour, exhausted my limited capacity for that. So then I thought, you're allowed to ask for some things. So I asked Allah to rain on me his mercy to wash me with his mercy, to clean me of all of my middle-class compromises and fudges and all of the rubbish. In that moment, it started raining. It doesn't rain on Arafah. I started laughing because I thought, I I didn't mean it literally. And then, of course, I couldn't help it. I wept. It was... It was so beautiful, as if my prayer had been immediately answered. And I like to feel that that was my proof that our lives is very close, that we forget how close he is, how, how sensitively he listens to everything. <laughs> وصلى الله تعالى على خير ألق محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين آمين this is the day that Hajj is all about. It's the day when you actually repent and ask for forgiveness with total sincerity, hoping that Allah will forgive you. I'm full of joy in some sense that, you know, hoping that Allah has forgiven me. You know, it does say that once you leave this place, you're like a newborn baby. But, you know, I just uh, want to carry on and carry on and keep, I just want to stay here as long as possible, you know, and hoping that I'll be able to stay here at least until after sunset. So people are already starting to leave, but I don't want to go. You know, it's, it's just such a moving experience. And like I just said, I'm, I'm still shaking. We pray to Allah. Allah give to us everything. Yes, Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We, we need more mosques for everybody was. Yeah, that's Inshallah. Inshallah. We all Muslim together and we all united. Mashallah. The atmosphere has been good. Just enjoyed it very much, Mashallah. It's a very humbling experience. It's a big test. Amazing. I actually got to the Mount of Mercy. It's like everybody's on there. It's like little white dots on a mountain. SubhanAllah. It's absolutely beautiful, Mashallah. It is the place to be. People are just clinging to the very pinnacle of it and clambering over each other to try and get to the point. And uh, it was too dangerous for the road to go out there, so um, we just stood at and looked at it from a distance. It was also very moving for him because he, he was joining in with the prayers and he was also asking for forgiveness and he was putting his hands up and begging for mercy.
but I've had to console him with some ice cream at the moment, which he's happy with. I think he just devoured that. <laughs> I think um, being on Mount Arafat was like the most important part of the whole journey. There's this phrase that says al hajj Arafat, which basically means Hajj is being on Mount Arafat. Because you know apparently on that day that when God is supposed to descend to the lowest of the heavens with the angels and he says to the angels, look here are my people. And um, it's supposed to be a day when God sort of like answers your prayers and that's the closest you can get to him. Later on in the day, after Maghrib, which was when pretty much the day was over, um, I started feeling a bit guilty about how I maybe didn't make the most of the day because I was so tired. And then other people said, you're always going to think that, though, and loads of people feel that way. And I'm going to do my hamdulillahs, Allah akbaras, and those. Exactly. <laughs> As sunset approaches, the pilgrims gather their belongings and prepare themselves for the long night that awaits them. The pilgrims now rush down from Arafat to the valley of Muzdalifa on the way back to Mina. Here they will spend a part of the night resting, praying, and gathering up the pebbles they will use to stone the Jamarat, pillars that symbolically represent the devil. Alhamdulillah, we're now arriving to Muzdalifa. Uh, at Muzdalifa, you will pray Maghrib and Aisha, and also you will collect the stones. Uh, the stones will be seven for the first day, 21, uh, for the second day, 21 for the third day. So total will be 49. You go to Muzdalifa and you pray the last two prayers of the day together. It's the only time in your life that you'll probably ever allow to ever delay your mother prayer. The idea behind that is, is that it gives you maximum time for prayer. So you delay it until the very last part of the night. You do your two prayers together, then you just rest. And hopefully, you know, you'll be able to pick up some pebbles um, from Mustalifa, which you can take with, with you tomorrow to stone the devil. You look up and you look down, and you, all you see is a sea of white people, all there for only one reason, and that is because the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our Prophet, actually rested there for that night. Probably a night I'm not going to get. We slept on a piece of bare land and went to Fajr and prayed. And the prayer then, the prayer of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is a very beautiful one, where you say, you have been astray. You admit very, very clearly that your life has been away from God, and now you've returned, and you pray for forgiveness. We walked for about three and a half hours to get to Mina. You were walking with people who were rushing to pitch their tents under the, or pitch their mats rather, under the bridges and carrying their pots. And I, I loved it. I really felt this is, this is the family of Islam. Returning back to Mina, the pilgrims will spend the next three days completing the rites of Hajj. Well, Jamarat is, is the place where, where you go to stone the devil. Um, we were lucky in that we got there quite early before most of the crowds did. Um, and so we could do that quite easily. We got quite close, so, I mean, it was an easy task, and at the same time, it wasn't too busy that it was quite dangerous. I mean, unfortunately, 15 people were killed there yesterday um, because the crowds do get really violent. I mean, people do go and stone the devil, and they, they really think they're stoning the devil, and they get really aggressive. When we were there, we got, I almost got elbowed in the face and 
and all sorts of things. But be because there weren't so many people, you could sort of move out the way a little. But there was a lady I know who, in our group, who had on her nose broken. She had to go to hospital. Her nose was pouring with blood. What we do on the first day when we come back from Mustali for Minar is go to the big shaitan, the big devil, and stone him seven times with seven pebbles. And again, as people were filtering back from Mustalifa, they were all going off there. And again, it's the, the scenes are just amazing. You get three million people all trying to go there and stone uh, one pillar. Um, at one point, it got very, very dangerous for the rover, and we had to actually pull back. And the army had to come in and actually, you know, uh, hold people back and, and allow people to come because of, of, of the fear of squashing other people. What happens after that is um, we normally sacrifice an animal in commemoration of uh, the, the, the Prophet Ibrahim, um, you know, having been asked to sacrifice his son Ismail. Um, but there are other practical reasons why we do it again. I mean, Allah in his wisdom has told us to do it, but the, the, some of the practical reasons for it is that this is a day of Eid for us. It's, it's a day of remembrance, it's a day of commemoration, it's a day of celebration. Uh, it, it completes our Hajj. Um, although it's not complete in its entirety, it's, it's one element of its completion stage. The animals that we sacrifice, we don't take uh, any meat from it other than a small portion. The most, most of the animal goes to the poor people and it's distributed around the area, it's distributed in the third world. We had one guy come over, offered to do the sacrifices for us. What we've done is all the people that are staying in our tent, we've paid him to go off and actually find the animals and, uh, and, and sort them on our behalf. We're just waiting for the news of him. Uh, once he's given us you know, the OK, yet yeah, it's been done. Uh, what normally happens then is that we do what we've done, the Hulk, we, sh we shave the heads. And we feel like newborns, we wash and we go back to normality in, in, in many ways. We start dressing, um, we take these arms off, we dress with normal clothes, and, and we have the wash. You know, once we've washed, uh, we celebrate what is known as Eid. <laughs> الله أكبر كبيرا والحمد لله كثيرا وسبحان الله بكرة واصيلا During the three days that the pilgrims spend in Mina, Muslims elsewhere around the world are celebrating Eid. Last night I went to stone the Jamarat again, this time stoning the three Jamarat and you can see the people on the upper section, uh, which is the safer section. And at night it's relatively easy. And again, stoning Shaitan, this was Abraham resisting every blandishment Shaitan could throw at him for him not to follow God's will. Constantly, I'm finding always, you know, where is my sincerity? Where is my hypocrisy? Am I really going to change? I've got to change, otherwise this is a sham. This is, you know, this is, just, I've just been here for the view. You don't come here for comfort. You come here to totally and radically renew your commitment to a very simple fact which is we came from God and we've got to claw our way back to him, any which way we can. Last night, the chapel went out to do the qurbanis, the sacrifice. He didn't come back till about 10, half past 10. And so what we decided to do was to call it a night and actually um, go to bed take a rest and perhaps wake, get up this morning and, and then start doing the halak, which is the shaving of the head. Um, so that's what we're going to do now. Initial prayers of the way you just take To the one take Westerner, this is chaos. This is chaos and you can't see the spirituality in it. But when you're in the middle of it, 
and you can feel the prayer of the people sitting on their cardboard, reading their Quran. Their prayer is real. Their prayer is real. And their discomfort is part of the strengthening process that they must never, never take anything for granted. I lost my luggage while I was in Muzdalifa, and our stones were with our luggage, so we didn't have any stones, we didn't have any luggage. We were given some stones that day by some, some friends in our group who had collected extra stones. And so actually today I have to try and get hold of more stones so that we can complete that task. Tonight I'm not going to go and do that for myself because you can get ask someone else to do it on your behalf. Once you've done the first lot, I believe they're the most important ones. You know, somebody said to me today, actually, that you can't get someone to do it on your behalf unless you're very sick or very ill. No. But no. I don't believe that's right. No, we have asked the imam and he said that you can opt for someone to do it on your behalf but because of the sheer uh, number of people. Where, apart from the pilgrimages that were grafted on in the sort of medieval times, there really wasn't a sense of the real hard work of uh, your religious life matched in some form of worship. And walking miles and being in a crowd and being jostled, having fear, real fear, that you might slip and if you did, you'd be squashed and that's it. As a metaphor of the spiritual life, it's very good because you, you realize this isn't fighting shaitan, seeking God, it's not praying occasion. It's not just sort of um, reading inspirational pretty poetry. It's hard work. I was brought up with the cathedral monastic background that your prayer was in a quiet place. Um, your prayer was in serenity, your prayer was in uh, a condition in which um, you had no distractions other than your focus on God. And then of course you were released into real life and there was no silence. In Islam, the prayer in action is the Hajj. Because all the time you were doing any of these things, this is prayer. You probably noticed this morning, I'm not very good at shaving heads. It became rather sticky and difficult, so a couple of the brothers there tried to help out. Uh, but in the end, what I did was just take him to the, the shower, stick him under the shower and just shave his head there with a, a safety razor. And it actually turned out quite nice. You know, I'm quite proud of that. <laughs> I did mine as well. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did mine, it's, it's exactly the same as that. And um, I did that without a mirror as well. On the final day of Hajj, the pilgrims should throw their last lot of pebbles and leave Mina before sunset. Prophet Ibrahim, when he was taking his son to sacrifice, he was stopped on the way by the shaitan, and so he picked up some pebbles and actually uh, stoned the devil and told him to go away because he was trying to prevent it. Um, it's like actually going there and actually seeing the actual place where it happened, the actual place where he was doing the stoning. It just brings another dimension to the whole thing.
His boss had no left. This is his last day and he really wanted to do it today. You've got two more to go. Do yeah. you think you can do it? Do we put it away? Do you want to wait for a little while? Yeah, let the crowds go. Uh, no, they won't go. They'll carry on and they'll carry on. They'll come and come. Can you see them? Look. Yeah? Huh? Okay, cool. Look at that now. If you get lost, yeah. it's that control tower. Yeah. yeah? There's a green sign next to it that says medium jump around. Oh, you wait there for us, all right? Oh, okay. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? All right, now hold on tight. Yeah. is I feel like we've sort of completed the most important tasks like Mount Arafat was the most important day um, and that's over and that's that's the, the most important part of Hajj also I did the tawaf and everything I've just got to do, say my farewell to Mecca before I leave I've enjoyed the simplicity of it all I've enjoyed the fact that you don't have to worry about what you're gonna wear in the morning it's not about what you look like at all it's it's about what you're here for and what's in your heart and in your mind and that sort of thing. Brand new book. So you reckon even if I like murdered somebody? Well, not, it, not my intention, my intention to do it. So I've pretty much finished. I'm pretty much a fully fred, fledged hajja in a sense. Um, it's really funny, everyone calls me ya hajja ya sahira, which is basically Young Hajel, small Hajel. Oh, this is the Kaaba, this is the Kaaba. But on the whole, I feel like I just want to go home now and relax and be able to sleep in my nice, comfortable bed and have nice hot showers and, and that sort of thing. And I miss my dad and my brother. <laughs> We just managed to struggle out again, didn't we? Yeah. We've got to try and leave Mina before Maghrib time. And we've got about two hours flat to do that in. So we've got to try and make our way back to our tents, get our luggage and get out of Mina. It might be a bit difficult because you'll probably find that there's literally thousands and thousands and thousands of coaches and nearly every one of these people are going to be trying to leave. So we'll just have to join the crowds and, and try and do our best. Having completed the rites of Hajj, the pilgrims now return to Mecca for their farewell visit. very very hard it's been a lot harder than I thought it would be I mean we've been here over a week now and it's been a long hard slog with event after event after event um, you know just coming here and not even having had the time to recuperate properly and then going straight off to Mina and from Mina having gone off to you know Muzdalifa and then Arafat and so and so and so and so and especially with this young guy I mean at the beginning of this uh, week, I thought that he was on a high, he was on a euphoria really, and he was going to have a hangover, but he hasn't really had one. Um, he's just been so resilient and very tough. I just thought to begin with that it was just something that young children do, is that they, they discover something new and that they were actually going to give up in the end. But this guy, he's a, um, I, I've learned something from this man. And I think one of the best things I did, you know, is to bring him with me. You're never going to get a scene like this anywhere else in the world, are you? Make the most of it because Monday night we're going, you know that. As you see, I'm back in Mecca in considerable luxury and I'm missing Mina. I was able to spend one more day there, which was very necessary for me. Mina is the preparation of the rest of your life. It really is the focus of what is to be the action of your Hajj, not just a memory, but a real preparation for your life. And this time, 
I'm going to try to button up my cynicism, which I believe must come partly from shaitan as well as from the hardcore observations of life. But I believe change is possible. For me to trust that I can be helped is probably my miracle of hajj. Definitely my attitude towards Islam has changed, I think. I mean, I've met so many different people with different sort of ideas and points of view, but what I really liked was meeting people whose ideas I could sort of relate to and whose ideas I actually admired. That was really nice, because I don't really tend to meet that many Muslims in England. I don't have many Muslim friends at all. I think I'd like to come again a bit later on in life. I'd like to do it slightly differently so that I could actually really focus on the spiritual aspect of it. I came in search of the truth really anyway and I'm still on that journey. If you'd like to take part in the community event that complement Islam UK, call free phone 0800 011 011 or visit the website www.bbc.co.uk slash Islam. Thank you.